Ähm, aber ich glaube, wir haben nicht die Zeit, dass er, wenn ihr Fragen habt, wäre es vielleicht besser. Ich habe noch einen zweiten Vortrag, ähm, heute haben wir dann zwei, glaube ich, ähm, wenn ihr da Fragen stellt. But anyway, um, that's the return for evening. So, um, as you might know, um, my colleagues and I, Brad Hat, we um, developed a uh, system, the GPN system, and probably the most uh, uh, mostly used one on, on Linux today. Um, the, this keynote, I kind of want to just reiterate what it actually is and, and how we came to where we are today. Um, maybe briefly, why I think this is where we're going. Um, so, this is not going to be a, a, a extremely technical uh, presentation. Um, at least my other one is going to be much, much more technical. Um, but anyway, let's just jump right, right in. So, um, if we reinvent the init system, the question of course is what is actually an init system? Um, and the init system is process number one on uh, most um, Unix and Linux, all Unix and Linux systems. Uh, process number one, um, like uh, the one is an ID, like this is how Unix work in the science of the IDs to every single process that runs in the system. A process is basically a program that's running. Um, the, the process are numbered in the order that it started. That's at least how it did in the beginning. So PID1 is like the first one that runs, right? Kernel initializes, it starts one first process, and that one process is responsible for bringing up the system, for keeping the system running, and for shutting it down again in the end. And that's uh, what a net system basically is. Um, Systemd now is one implementation of that. It's not the first one, it's by far not the only one, but it is um, the one that is uh, nowadays default in, in, in most of the big distributions. Um, actually, it's probably all of the big distributions are nowadays default. So, regardless if you run Ubuntu, if you run Debian, if you run Fedora, Ravel, or OpenSUSE, it doesn't really matter. Um, on all of them, Systemd is the implementation that runs as PID1. Um, as I mentioned, it's not the first one, so a couple of predecessors, the best known ones are System 5 Edit, which is the one that was a standard of Linux for the longest time. Um, but everybody, at least the ones of you who probably started more than three years ago, something was, was Linux probably have used. Upstart um, is another one. Upstart is the one that uh, used to be default on uh, Ubuntu at least, and for a brief period also the door. Um, Upstart is basically what we replace with system. Um, Init systems don't not only exist on, on, system, on uh, Linux itself, they also exist in other Linux operating systems and Unix like operating systems. Um, so the most important is just to mention them on, on, on Mac OS machines, right? Um, the, the component that, that kind of plays the same role as system does in Linux um, is Launchdeep. And uh, another one that's pretty well known is for people who still use or I used to Solaris SNF is the replacement there, as I mentioned, for service management framework. Now, um, uh, while Linux system is the traditional name for what I'm talking about here on Linux, I kind of prefer different names for that. One that other people use at least is service manager, because that kind of describes what it actually means. But by the way, I know I'm speaking very fast. If I'm speaking too fast, just show up and I'll try to slow it down. But no one is showing up, so I can continue. <laughs> um, so, service manager. What's a service manager? A service manager manages services. What's kind of what the name suggests. Um, but a service, yeah, we'll talk about a little bit later what a service is, but ultimately, a service is just little components, little runtime components that make up an operating system. And as much as it's the job of the, of the um, inner system to keep the system, bring it up, keep it running, and shut it down. Um, it does so by starting services, keeping them running, and shutting them down. I generally prefer the name System Manager today because um, actually what System does is substantially more than just um, manage services. It also manages things like uh, file systems because, um, I mean, as you boot up a system, um, the way it works is you start a couple of processes, then you look for the devices that the root file system is on, then you, uh, when it shows up, um, the, the, those devices, you file system checks them, which is in turn a service of its own the file system checker. Then you mount it, which is also again a service. Then as it appears, you can proceed to the next step and actually start services from it, or services that want to access that. So, um, a, a init system is substantially more than just services, even though services are kind of the main focus. That's why I tend to prefer the name system manager, because it's yeah, it describes more what it does. It pulls together the entire system and manages 
um, a lot of really, really basic facets of it. Um, something that's also important is like if the end system does its um, stuff the correct way, you should never ever notice it either, right? Like at least a user who only interfaces with a computer or with a, with a UI the way he should, um, an end system is something that should never be visible, much like the car that runs underneath. Um, but let's focus again on the uh, term certs. So uh, I briefly mentioned it already um, that a service makes up the, the runtime of the, of the system. But a service is a collection of processes that jointly provide specific functionality to the system, either for local or remote clients. To give an example of that is, for example, it's, it's uh, I don't know, MySQL, for example, or whatever MySQL turned into today. Um, so MySQL is a, is a collection of processes that serves either local or remote services by providing database functionality. But Apache, or whatever website you want to use today, same thing. Apache is a, is a collection of services, a collection of processes. Like there's the main process, and then for every connection coming in, it has a specific process or even CGI scripts that process that one request. So if you pull that all together, um, if you have your um, system that runs a MySQL instance and Apache instance, there you go, you have at least two services. You actually will have quite a number more because the, the, the basic operating system usually comes with a couple of, uh, of those uh, automatically, but uh, the ones you can, of course, those two. Um, a service manager, right? Again, that's the thing that system is. Um, has three key jobs to do with services. It's starting a service again. This, the complexity that is um, that, that, that involves starting services is dealing with dependencies, right? If, you, if we go back to this example here, my simple Apache. Let's say we put together a very simple website, and that website accesses the database. That basically implies that before the website is started, before Apache is started, the database has already to be up, right? So, um, if we start services, we need to think about dependencies. We need to think that uh, first, we start Apache uh, MySQL, and then when that uh, signal that, it's, um, that the startup is complete, then we can go on to the next step and start the, the, the web service. That, of course, gets a lot more complex if you look at the entire system, right? Like, if we only look at two specific services, it's going to be easy. But the entire system is way more complex. I already mentioned that with, for example, with the, with the mounting, mounting and the file system checking. If you now actually think about real life um, instances of that, it basically means because usually at least the, the more complex systems get, you know, just have one file system. And uh, so you basically have, yeah, you wait for the devices to show up, and then you have multiple, and then you wait for, like after each individual device showed up, you run the individual file system checker, and after in, the individual file system checker, uh, finish, you mount the individual thing, and then when all of those completed all these steps, then you go on and can start the first services, and then you can start that and that and that. So the entire dependency tree that you have is usually way more complex. Um, system E actually provides you with ways how you can plot these dependencies. So you get like directed graphs for all of those, like which probably are most of you who, who study uh, like graph theory in one way or another. And these graphs, unfortunately, in real life tend to be uh, way complex. So I won't put them on on the screen here because they are way larger than could fit in the screen. It's so long actually that um, it's pretty useless to actually look at them. Um, but uh, yeah, so the interesting bit about starting services is that you have to think about it. The interesting thing about keeping services running is something else. It's about monitoring them, right? Um, so let's say, for example, you have a system that runs a printing service in some way, cups. Many systems do, like Apple does, for example, even though I don't have it uh, connected to it. The job that the service manager has um, while the service is running to make sure that it stays running, right? At least to the parameters that you specified or that the developer specified or the administrator specified at the time that the uh, printer server was put together. Um, that basically means monitoring them, like watching. Um, uh, does the service run and notice another thing when the service stops running for a normal reason or for some other reason. And then um, restarting them if that's happening, <coughs> right? Depending on policy, of course, because there are some things you want to restart automatically and other things where you would not want to do that. Um, but it generally, in general, that's kind of what the service manager does. It has a job of making sure that, um, uh, yeah, it notices everything going on with the service and makes sure it stays running. It's kind of what um, 
makes systems robust, right? Um, this matters to some level on my laptop here, but it matters to way more level um, and the more technically advice is gets. Like if you're, for example, building a car, and cars tend to have running systems, uh, multiple of them these days. If the service bar <coughs> stops running in the, in the middle of everything, then it might be much more fatal um, to the device and maybe to you in person than it might be on my laptop here. But um, yeah. And then the other thing is shutting down services. Um, if you shut down services, you have to do so cleanly and you have to think about dependencies again. Um, you have to think about dependencies because if you, for example, shut down the database, you need to make sure that all the services that want to write um, to the database before things shut down can do so before you actually go and shut down the database. So you have to do think about dependencies. And you have to think about something else, which is killing leftovers. That sounds brutal, but it's the terminology that uh, Unix introduced for shutting things down. Um, it's actually one of, the, of, the, of my favorite examples where systemd um, is, in my theory, way better than, than uh, um, the previous um, incarnations of the Unix system. Because killing things properly and not leaving leftovers uh, around is a very, very hard problem. It's uh, like, especially in System 5 Linux, what happened actually, it didn't really do this job properly. What it did, um, you forked off a, a, a service and, and uh, when you wanted to shut it down, you asked the service polarity to go away. Um, and then the service would implement that as good or bad as it wanted to do that, right? So if you have a complex service, like for example a web server that starts um, um, worker process and the worker process starts CGI scripts and whatnot, and there was no guarantee that that web service, when you ask it to shut down, would actually properly shut down and not just kill itself, but also everything it ever forked off, like every other process it started in that make up this big service that uh, Apache is. With systemd, on the other hand, you do get the guarantee that everything, um, that the stuff that the service manager initially started the process, plus everything that these processes forked off, like all the additional processes that were started, are properly shut down before the system goes down. Um, it's a surprisingly complex thing, and it's one of the areas where, where it's very, very basic where system needs better than the previous incarnations. Now, um, so much about service management, I hope you got a little bit of a grasp of what, what it does. System D, or the, service, the system manager, does substantially more than just that, right? Like, this was just one facet of it. Just to quickly go over that, like, file system management, I also kind of mentioned, like, this thing was um, uh, waiting for devices to show up, file system checking the mounting them. It does logging to a, a, a certain level, like, because, um, when we looked into service management, we figured out like one of the key things that service management needs to be about is that when the services have something to, to report, then we collect that. So the concept is called logging on, on Unix, and uh, we added that to system so that we can make sure that if you um, introspect this, uh, like if the administrator introspects the state of the service at the runtime, we can show him um, what the, the last output of that service was and what the service has to say about itself um, when it runs the uh, running state. There's device management and system D, meaning that, uh, uh, that one component of it called UDEF is, is responsible for figuring out what physical devices, like what mice, what keyboards, what printers, what, whatever, are currently connected to the system and permits other uh, programs on the system to enumerate them and figuring out what's actually viable. There's a network management component that basically is capable of uh, setting up the network for you. There's container integration, container being like this buzzword um, on uh, uh, Linux today. I'm not going to into detail what that actually is for those of you who don't know it yet. Anyway, there's logger management. Logger management is basically about um, keeping track of the actual physical users um, um, using the system uh, and um, yeah, and the setup they have. Um, so much a little bit about what system it does and what the service. Uh, service, service System manager actually does. Now let's go, like, move on from that and actually have a discussion about um, the ph philosophy behind it. Now, um, for those of you who haven't been in contact with Elmer's Linux, um, you know that there were um, quite a bit of discussions around System D in, in the community. It took a while until um, System D was actually adopted. The question is, like, if you see all that, the question is, of course, um, is it too much what it does? My opinion, of course, is um, it's not. My opinion is, uh, yeah, it needs to do all these kind of things. The thing is, like, all these individual bits is on every system you build, um, you need all that, right? Regardless if you build a web server, or you build a car, or if you build a light bulb, um, one, 
you generally need all that functionality. You need the log, you need the service management, you nowadays always need the networking and so on. And nothing of that, I believe, um, is something that, that really deserves thinking about. Because people, like if they build systems, they generally don't build the systems in order to run systemd. They don't really care about running systemd. They build the systems to build a light bulb or to build a car. And systemd is just a means to an end there. And I'm pretty sure that none of these problems that systemd deals with are problems that should be dealt with by the people who actually build systems. They should just be there and just be alive. But it's a, it's a question to, 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 to discuss. I um, answered for my side of things. Most distributions apparently agree. But uh, yeah, there are other things in that. The other question that always was uh, raised is um, whether what we did with systemd was reinventing the wheel. And that's a valid question. Um, of course we did actually, right? Because systemd after all is not the first in the system around. And, and um, with what it does, it does pretty much the same thing as system five minutes or upstart did. However, we, we believe that it does that systematically better than um, how they did it. Or to say it's even differently, like the, the best implementation that there was of this stuff before system came along was upstart. And we simply figured out after, um, like we believe for a while that upstart would be the future of Linux system. But after a while looking at it, we came to the conclusion that systematically actually what it does, um, does it the wrong way around. Because what upstart did, it actually did not deal with dependencies in these kind of things. Instead, pulled everything like this dependency tree from, from its um, foot to its head, or the other way around, um, basically where instead of declaring that that service below, uh, um, needs that service and then um, uh, automatically having the computer figure out that you have to um, start them in the opposite order, what they did is basically you had to configure that, that when that service has started up, the other service is now ready to start up. Which is like, yeah, I'm only briefly glancing over this year, but the, the basically um, it maximizes um, the, the stuff that has to be started in the system and um, lets the administrator or developer figure out um, the order in which things are, have to be started and, instead of letting the computer do that. Um, discussing more about that would probably fill an entire talk with all of its own, but the gist of it is really, um, yes, we did re re reinvent the wheel to a certain point, but it's kind of like, you could compare it with, with like, um, the, the people who invented the car eventually came up with, with like air-filled uh, tires. And sure, that is a re literal reinvention of the wheel, right? If you compare it with, with a horse car that came before and that had fixed wheels like made of wood. But sure, would you really complain about that um, to the people who invented the car? So I think, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's to a certain level reinvention of the wheel, but it's worth uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's worse. Um, the other question is like people think it's too unified. I think that's a good thing. Um, because um, ultimately, um, again, this is about uh, turning something into commodity that wasn't a commodity before. Something that um, people should really should be thinking about. Something should just, just be there. It should behave in a, in a somewhat uniform way, so the administrators don't really have to deal with it so much, and then it's always the same. Um, yeah. Um, I have a couple of more slides. Um, something about advocacy and adoption, about the history, basically. Um, Pushing system through um, into the ecosystem was not easy, I can tell you, um, because um, all of the discussions involved. We don't really know how we actually managed to pull that off, that it actually worked. Mm -hmm. because, I mean, what you should never forget is that system was not the first attempt to, to um, reinvent uh, init systems. Right? There were quite a few attempts to do that before. After all, I mean, system 5 init is something that stayed basically unmodified for 20 minutes. Uh, for 20 minutes. For 20 <laughs> years. Um, before we came and tried to replace it. Um, so other people tried that before us. We don't really understand why we actually pulled it off and the others didn't, um, but I don't know, we must have done something right, um, even though it was really, really messy and probably a lot of people um, still blame us for having done that. But um, I don't know, what, uh, what I really just want to make clear is like it's not about the code quality, for example. Right? Like I think Upstart's code quality was excellent. I just think fundamentally, philosophically, it's broken. But the, like had a broken concept. But then again, um, usually it doesn't even matter to have a better product, right? Like because it's not none of the Linux community like otherwise there wouldn't be talk, right? Um, no, um, it's really about uh, convincing the right people at the right time. Um, we first convinced Fedora. Like I work for Red Hat, so that was kind of easy. Fedora is kind of attached to Red Hat in some way. But it's uh, it was still um, hard enough because uh, I don't know. There's change is hard, right? Um, and people are not really willing to make changes unless 
um, if there's a specific area of, of, of expertise, there's a specific area of development. Right? Like if I'm a web developer, I'm all interested in, in the new web technologies, but I really don't care about the stuff that runs uh, like, like uh, changes underneath. And it probably it might even disrupt my work, so I won't like it. But then again, I think ultimately um, it brings big, big benefits in this in a way. Like, I mean, if you don't want changes, you probably shouldn't be in IT, right? Um, there's probably no technology uh, in the world that has changed as much as IT. In the, um, yeah, in the few years. Anyway, so uh, we first managed to get into Fedora. Um, that was a big fight, but ultimately um, um, doable. I mean, what people do not um, really understand, like, it wasn't even a fight for us ourselves, because, like, my manager, Red Hat, for example, when he first heard that I was working on this, um, he really didn't like that and told me to stop. I didn't, but um, uh, ultimately, Red Hat management actually saw the benefit of that, and, and as Realm, like, as Red Hat Enterprise Limited, just the core of the business, they, I managed to convince them eventually that this should be. Um, at the core of the business, um, because running, like it's an operating system, and having something like this at the core of the operating system is kind of a necessity. The final thing that, um, where we managed to convince people was Debian, actually, there was a, was a really, really massive discussion, and we actually stayed mostly out of it, because, I don't know, we are not Debian people, and um, we went to one of the conferences, but I have a suspicion that what, like, the, the presentations we gave at the conference kind of did as much good as it is bad. But ultimately, the Debian people um, came to the conclusion that, that going the system way um, is the right way. And then it immediately resulted in a good to also switching. Um, yeah, um, system is Unix. I don't have that much time anymore, but uh, it's, like, I don't have that many slides either anymore. Um, like, this is one, like, system is, of course, operating, like, like, like part of an operating system for, for Unix. Unix is this mythical operating system that probably nobody in this room ever used himself directly. At least I can say for myself, I never used proper Unix myself. I only used Linux and uh, other Linux -like, uh, Unix like operating systems, but never in true Unix. But um, I don't know. Um, there, like, there's much criticism that system was Unix. I don't think the question matters because um, it's an operating system was was designed 70, yeah, like in the 70s. That's that's like 40 years ago now, and computers have changed dramatically since then. But then again, Unix is the greatest inspiration to us, um, and it's not a religion, right? Like it is like if you think about one operating system that the legend the design of um, system the um, the most, but it's obviously Unix. But then again, I don't know. Yeah, um, system today um, we consider a set of basic building blocks to build an OS from, not just an inner system. Um, and yeah, the, the development where we want to uh, push uh, system next, um, I, just, I just put a couple of things there. Um, like one concept we call portable services. It's kind of taking a page out of uh, how much time do I have actually? Just one, two minutes. Two minutes. Um, uh, the portable services is something taking a page out of the book that containers are and trying to to adapt that to classical services. <coughs> Um, and for example, means uh, the ability to pack them up so to run them from, from as an entire um, like image on the system. Another focus um, that we have is security, um, and that's actually what my second talk uh, today will be about, about the specific the security aspect, the sandboxing aspect of the um, uh, system. Um, I believe that part is highly relevant today. We live in a world, in a personal world, we know that uh, um, uh, three-letter agencies and, and, and uh, evil people hack systems systematically on the internet, and hence, as the people who kind of build the basic component of the make it up an operating system, I think it's our duty to make sure that services run in a, in a, in a secure environment, in a lockdown environment, um, where um, if the hacker manages to exploit a service, um, what he can do on the system is, is very, very limited. So, um, yeah, but specific steps um, towards the direction in, in what's that direction, and we can dis uh, discuss in the other talk. But uh, yeah, I think it's of uh, extreme relevance to everybody who's doing um, operating systems today to always think about um, uh, how we can improve security and, and how our systems should, should look like if we, if we want to care about security. And that's all I have at this moment. Um, I think I've got like less than one minute left or something. So I'll take exactly one question now and all the other questions we can have in the other event. But if nobody has a question, I'll have a question. If nobody has a question. Did anybody understand what I was saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a question. No, I understood. <laughs>